Meeting is now streaming on Facebook. Yep, that's my dog. Go for it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carl Weiderquist. I'm here to talk about universal basic income, which is a certain small income sufficient for, necessar for necessities shall be given to everyone, whether they work or not. And a larger income shall be given to those who do some work that the community recognizes as useful. On this basis, we can build further. That's how Bertrand Russell described what's now known as basic income way back in, in 1960, 104 years ago. It didn't even have a name back then. The, this idea has become, has become far more popular and powerful it has had many waves of support in the last hundred years and is only gaining in support around the world right now. And I wanna to talk to you all about this policy and its relationship with the property rights system. The title of my talk today is Who Should Own Property? And maybe it would be better to call it can property be justified? Because it's not really about which person should own property, but, but can you do anything to justify property? Because when I ask for a basic income, when I say I support basic income, a universal income, I say that we need this because a person is not free if you can block them from all access to the resources they need to survive. And that is exactly what we do. We do this we do this every day by, by saying that the resources of the earth are owned by some and not by others. And the only way that these people who don't own property can get some access to the resources they need to survive is to go to this group that owns property and says, and say, can we work for you? Please, sir, will you give me a job and work for you? Uh, and uh, people respond to that, you're not free unless you don't have to work? Well, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you're not free unless you don't have to work for some specific group of people, the property owners. What we've done, work has always existed, but what we've done is we've changed work. We've changed the meaning of the word work in a way that is extremely important. And we've gotten people just to accept that work is going to a person who has money and offering to provide services for them in exchange for cash. That's what we think of as work. Work is getting a job. Work is, or maybe becoming an independent contractor and becoming your own boss, even though you're still working for clients. That's what we think of as work. That's not what work has been for the first few hundred thousand years that humans were on this planet. And it's not what work is for all the other animals on the planet. There are no animals aside from humans that have to pay rent in order to access some of the resources of the earth to lay their head down at night and find a safe place to sleep. We are not allowed to hunt and gather, fish, farm like our ancestors did for hundreds of thousands of years. We are not allowed to start our own business or start our own cooperative. Only people with money are allowed to do these things because the private property says, system says these people own all the resources and the rest of us, if we wanna access to those resources have to go to them. Now that can't possibly be a justified system. Um, no one invented the resources of the earth. They were here before all of us. No one has special claim to them. So we need to think about how we got into the situation and what could possibly justify the situation. Well, how we got in, into this situation is well known by anyone who knows their history. In Europe, it was the colonial, it was, sorry, it was the, it was the enclosure movement in Europe where European powers went to the peasants who were typically sharing the land as, as community farmers and saying, oh, these rights that you have to use the land, those aren't really rights. Those are just traditions. This Lord here, we're gonna put this Lord here, put him in the manor and he's gonna be the real owner and you're gonna be tenants. He will pay you to work and you will rent property from him. He'll be your boss from now on. And if you don't like working for him, we'll kick you off the land that your ancestors have been on 
for hundreds or thousands of years and you can go to the city and maybe find a job there. That's what happened in Europe. And then at just about the same time, European powers went around conquering the rest of the world that much of which also had peasant agriculture and some of which still had hunters and gatherers, all of whom were sharing the land. And they conquered the land and took the people and said, now you have to work for these new people who are owners. And these are going to be either Europeans or, or, or local peoples who are privileged by Europeans to be the owners of property. And, and so we're all used to this idea that for the last few hundred years, working has become synonymous with getting a job and taking orders from somebody who owns property. But it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and, and this is hardly, when you look at the history of property, this hardly justifies the property rights system. Well, the property rights system is this vestige of European internal colonialism and European worldwide colonialism. Even after the Europeans left, they left a property rights system in place that was very different than what was there before. Uh, this is hardly a good justification for this system. What could possibly justify the private property rights system. And to think about what could justify it, I think it's important to think about what property is. Property is a duty. Property is an obligation. When I say this is mine, I mean, I'm putting the rest of the world under an obligation not to touch this, not to do anything with it unless uh, unless I give you permission, which for all of our own bodies, that's certainly a very good thing. I own my body, Ray owns his body, Katerina owns her body. I can't touch their body, they can't touch mine. I have dominion over my body. Now, if we all had some of the earth to go along with our bodies, that would be a nice fair exchange. This is my part of the earth, that's your part of the earth. You restrict my property as I respect yours, that would be consistent with equality before the law and an equal imposition of duties. But that's not how we did it. We created a system where a few people own all the property and most of us don't. So when somebody says respect my property, really what they're saying is respect my property as I would respect your property if you had any. But of course, most of you don't. So it's a really a one-way obligation. Um, now, it is possible for us to buy in to the property rights system, but to buy in, we have to go and work for those who have property and find some special service and become sort of an entrepreneur that uh, can, can give some sort of a very special contribution where we can really move up in the system and become a property owner. Very few of us do that. The fluidity for those of us who are born with nothing, who end up, uh, who end up, becoming very wealthy in our lives is very few people around the world. It is not as fluid as it seems when we focus on those rare people, uh, those people like the Elon Musks of the world. And Elon Musk didn't really start out, he didn't start out from nothing either. Uh, these people who move up don't make the whole system a reciprocal system. So what could justify a system where some people own the property and other people don't? And that is, if you want to control more of the resources of the earth, that means you want to put other people under an obligation, under a greater obligation, you should pay for that obligation. And that's where basic income comes in. Basic income is an unconditional income. It's given to you where you don't have to do anything to receive basic income, but it's given to you by the people who own property. It should be a condition of ownership of property that if you want to own more of the earth's resources than other people, you should be paying them for the privilege. So the justification of the property, if you're going to say, I want to put you all under an obligation, it should be then I will pay for that obligation. The property rights system that we have now is something for nothing where people own property and don't put, pay the people who are under the obligation to respect those property rights. They prayed the previous owner, but the previous owner didn't pay the rest of us to respect their property rights. And they might've paid the previous owner. But if you go back far enough, 
there was just some colonial person that seized that property and gave it to a privileged person that created that property. Those of us who are under the obligation to respect those rights have never been paid for. That's what I, that's what I envision basic income for. It is your, it is your payment for the fact that you own less property than everybody else. So I envision a world where you're paying for all the property that you own and you're receiving payments for all the property that everybody else owns. If you pay more than you receive, that is good and just and right because you're controlling more of the worst resources than the average person. If you're receiving more than you pay, that's what that's your reward for controlling or that's your compensation for having less access to the earth, but it's also your reward for using up less of the earth. The people who control and own the resources are also using up the earth. And the rest of us are using up less of the earth. The money that you get back in basic income is well-deserved, even though you get it unconditioned. And there are a lot of, when you look at the property rights system like this, there are a lot of side benefits from it. One thing is we can have a world without poverty. If we have a basic income that's large enough to meet your basic needs, no one ever has to live in poverty. None of us then needs to fear poverty. A lot, and, and now when you think of that, the number of us who live in poverty in, a well, in wealthy countries is fairly small. But the number of us that it is a constant threat is very large. The percentage of people that could never work another day in their life and aren't at retirement age and that never need work uh, another day in their life, they're not at retirement age, and they could live off of their assets for the rest of their life, the percentage of those people is very small. And those are the ones that the rest of us all have to go to for jobs. So this fear that we could end up in poverty and homelessness, this realistic poverty that if we don't keep, keep working for the power structure that exists, that if we don't keep doing this, we are going to end up poor, is a threat that hangs over all of our heads, not just the, the poor, but the entire middle class. Um, and people will try to make the middle class afraid of redistribution programs, saying that they're going to take from you. But actually, what the, the if you if the middle class looks like looks at basic income as something for those other people, those poor people, it's really ultimately self defeating. When you look at over the last fifty years we have gutted what redistributional systems we've had in most of the wealthy countries around the world, very much in the United States, but also quite a bit in Europe. The welfare system is much smaller than it was 40 or 50 years ago. And in that time, in the last about 41, 42 years, world output has doubled. World GDP has doubled, which means we could all be working the same and consuming twice as much, or we could be working half as much and consuming the same as we were 40 or 45 years ago. But in this, instead, most of us are working harder than we were 40 years ago, and we're consuming hardly anymore. Almost all the gains have gone to the top one or 2% of the population around the world. All the gains of a doubling of world GDP in the last 40 or 45 years. The rest of us have not shared in it, partly because we don't have this leverage. We don't have this leverage to say, if you don't share with me the fruits of what we're building together when you own and I work, if you don't share that with me, I won't work for you. All of us, almost all of us, 95, maybe 98% of the population are in this position where we ultimately have to work. We have no choice but to work. And when I say work, I don't mean we get to work for ourselves. I mean, we have to work for someone who has enough money to give us a job. When you free people from that, you free the entire middle class and the working class from the position where they have to take whatever job they can get, where they take whatever job is good for them. And that fixes the major incentive problem that we have in the world today. The incentive problem that the wealthy do not have a good incentive to create good wages good working conditions and share the benefits of economic growth with all of us. That's something that a basic income can, can do for all of us. 
Um, and so one of the worries that people have is that we have this big incentive problem that, and, and, and when I say, you know, the incentive problem, the real incentive problem in the world today is the poor incentive that companies have to pay good wages and offer good working conditions. And when, but people say, oh, well, but when I said incentive problem, I, I didn't mean that. I mean, what about this incentive for these lazy workers to get off their ass and work? Well, nobody's gonna work if you do that. Well, um, you really believe no one will work at any price? Any price at all? I mean, if somebody offered you what uh, Kobe Bryant is getting paid, would you know? Would you rather have a, a ten or twenty thousand dollar a year basic income than be Kobe Bryant or or uh, coach uh, uh, LeBron James or one of these ba uh, basketball players or a movie star or something like that? If you pay people enough, we have another old saying that says, you know, if uh, uh, everyone has their price, that if you pay people enough, they will work, uh, they will do what you want. Uh, now. So we believe if you pay people enough, they will work. On one hand, we always say that everyone has their price, but then we also wants to say, we want to say that there's these lazy workers that won't take a job. Well, what you mean then is, is, that, is that they won't work for the going wages. But then when you do that, you're siding in a dispute. We're deciding a dispute and we're deciding with the most privileged person in that dispute, the owner of the business. We're saying this person is not, a, why don't we, why do we say lazy workers and we don't say cheap employers? It's, we have a cheap employers who won't offer good working conditions, who won't offer the good wages that will get people to come out and work. That is the incentive problem. But we want to label the worker as lazy. We want to not even think about this as a dispute about wages and working conditions. We want to think about it as, as good poor people and bad poor people and never really even think about, oh yeah, I guess, well, I guess maybe employers could offer more money and that would get people to work. We should think about that incentive. That incentive is why we have shanty towns across the lesser developed world. That incentive is why we have people living on the streets in New York City and in San Francisco. That incentive problem is why the middle class in most of the world hasn't gotten a raise in the last 40 years. That is the incentive we need to fix. So ultimately, when the middle class thinks about redistributive programs as being for someone else, for those lower down people, it's not only self-serving for the more privileged, but it's self-defeating for the middle class because it puts us all, the entire middle class are in that position where we must work for this group of the most privileged, privileged people in the world. We all have to go to them to get a job. Basic income frees us from that. It gives every single person the power to say no to wages and working conditions that we don't personally find acceptable. And that solves that incentive problem that we have that has kept us all from getting better wages and better working conditions for all of these years. That is why we need a basic income. Now, another thing that people will ask about basic income before I think people will talk about, people will say, well, we can't afford it. It sounds so expensive. Well, it's not nearly as expensive as, as it sounds. When you think about giving an income to everyone, it sounds, wow, you take the population of the country and multiply that by a fifteen dollars or $20,000 a year basic income, that sounds like an awful lot of money. But remember, you're paying for what you have and getting paid for what you don't have. So those two things are going to even out. Almost all of us own something. And so all of us are going to be paying some taxes. And that means we're going to be paying the first part of our basic income ourselves. So a lot of basic income is a person paying themselves. That your taxes go up, but your basic income goes up. And those two things cancel each other out. So you look at your W-2 form, as we call it in the United States. Uh, you look at your form that you get with your pay stub that you get with your paycheck. And it's going to show, okay, your taxes went up, but your basic income went up. The two things cancel each other out. It's really not much difference for you. What you need to know to, to find out how much basic income costs is you need to look at the net. When you're saying, 
when I subtract, how much did you pay yourself? How much did you effectively pay yourself? And subtract that from your basic income, you'll find two groups. One group, net recipients, where the amount that they receive is greater than the amount they pay. Those are the net recipients. And the difference between those two, you add up the amount for each person, that is the net cost of basic income. And that is gonna be roughly equal to the, the net cost as the difference between net contributors, who are the people who are paying more than they receive. And I've done some calculations, which on my website, I'm happy to share with people that are also published, thing, published uh, in, in uh, journals and research reports about how much the net cost of basic income is. In the United States, according to my calculations, it came out to about 2.95% of GDP, which is $537 billion per year. That's less than our defense budget. That is, that is only about 20% or 20, 25% of current entitlement spending and only about, only about 10% of total government spending. So it's actually not a huge increase in government spending and or for something that would free every single American from ever having to fear poverty and economic destitution and homelessness ever again. Uh, George Arndt and I did similar calculations for the United Kingdom, which has a higher poverty line. Um, so, it was more, so it was more expensive in England. And it came out to, well, sorry, for the UK as a whole, not just for England. Uh, it came out to 3.4% of GDP when you took into account what programs it could replace. 3.4% of GDP or about 68 billion pounds a year. It's a smaller country. So in per capita terms, that's actually, that's actually a higher cost. Um, and, still, and it was less than Britain is spending right now on corporate subsidies and special corporate tax breaks. So you could actually eliminate poverty or virtually eliminate poverty in the United Kingdom and still have several billion pounds a year left over to, for, for a corporate subsidies only. And you could finance that entirely by getting rid of corporate subsidies. Basic income is very affordable. The elimination of poverty, the elimination for the threat of poverty from every single person is an extremely affordable program. And I will end there, and then we can go on to the panel discussions or questions on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Carl. We uh, are here in the Up Convergence channel that we call the Veganism and Global Transformation. And uh, we've been here all week, and we're in the uh, Peace Weekend where we're kind of reflecting on all, all the things that we've learned. And we've had a few presentations on universal basic income, and we're having a panel discussion of uh, the people that have given presentations. Carl's just given his and, and is, uh, uh, I think, uh, got that that appetite for basic income. Uh, I think we, th there's uh, a lot to be excited about in what he said there, and uh, expanding it to the ideas of, of ownership itself, because uh, a lot of people um, I think you aptly described it that a lot of people think, well, that's just uh, multiplying your population with a sum of money that uh, so most people aren't doing the math, but it's, it sounds like scary math. Mm -hmm. But with this understanding of ownership, everything balances out. It's a, it's a contract with our society, like everything is. Money is a contract with our society and not a particularly good one. Um, a lot of it really doesn't justify your existence and it's interesting we've been having a tug of war with the uh, currency group that's been talking throughout the week uh, for, for uh, our uh, scheduling time and they're kind of exploring the same thing why is money something that we're so hung up on and it causes more grief than um, than solutions Yet it's famous for being the thing that you throw, if you have enough of it, you can throw it at any problem and it'll solve it. Mm -hmm. So uh, rather than throwing money at problems, how can, how can we redefine what wealth is and redefine 
what ownership really is. And these are things that we are so bathed in that we're born into this world of understanding ownership. Mm-hmm. And probably from the terrible twos, we have the, that, that uh, famous mine is the word for the terrible twos. And uh, the ownership doesn't stop there. Yeah. So uh, we've, uh, I asked uh, Katerina Lindman, who uh, has, I've seen her give environmental presentations and I called her up and asked if she wanted to, to give an environmental presentation or a presentation on veganism. And she said, no, I want to talk about universal basic income. Yeah. And I said, great, because we've been embracing that, um, that topic yet haven't really um, got much of a, a background in it. We haven't gathered uh, in our, um, we have an online think tank called Vegan World 2026, where we look at all the problems that we need to, f- to fix in the next six years. And uh, I think this is a very critical for us to understand the veganism and global transformation channel is l- as much about teaching vegans all the pieces that we need as much as it is talking about veganism as a, as a filter for problems. So we want to ultimately mm-hmm. get our handle on this and apply our vegan filter and see what, uh, how the vegan movement can help this, this uh, become a reality. Now, so, yeah, we, and, I, and that's something that I, 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 I meant to tie in. I actually started to allude to that and then didn't, didn't get around to it when I say, when you think of property being justified in this way, I said there's, there's two effects of that and I really never got back to the other one. But the other one really ties into this, uh, the, the idea of veganism and, glo- and global transformation, especially the global, global transformation part. Is, but it has to do with better use of our resources. When, when you look at property like this, I think we're, we're looking at property rights all wrong. We're looking at property rights. The standard way to look at them is in the way that is most favorable to the use of the most privileged people, the people who own the most property, uh, we look at them as is they, they just naturally own the earth. They own most of the earth. And then the government taxes you. You know, they, the government doesn't really own anything. It just takes from you. And we think of that as, uh, you know, I, when, when we go to vote, we say, I'm a taxpayer. I pay my taxes. And those, so that makes me a customer of the government. And I should be getting money for, I, or I should be getting satisfaction for what I'm buying for the government, which is with my tax dollars, uh, which is government services. And we should not be thinking of it that way at all. What we should thinking of is what you buy with taxes is your property. You don't buy property from the previous owner because he just got it from somebody, got it from somebody, got it from somebody, got it from some colonial power who just stole it from humanity as a whole. You should be looking at taxes, not as buying anything except for the right to hold your property. That is the true payment of your property is paying your taxes. The true, and then what you're paying is the community and you're paying for the damage you're doing to the community's endowment, our earth, our globe. You're paying for the damage you're doing by taking things out of the common and making it your own. When you think of property like this, it gives you a much greater flexibility. Well, not only can we set the price for which we will let private individuals own property, but we will also set the term. So we're not only going to charge you for owning land, we're going to charge you for any pollutant that you might put into our water or into our air or into our ground. And some of those pollutants we're going to ban outright. We're also going to think about the system because what the government should be doing is thinking of itself not as the representative of the taxpayer, but as the custodian of the people's endowment. Our environment is the people's endowment, and we should be maximizing not the monetary value of that endowment, but the true value of that endowment, which includes the fact that it is the environment that sustains us. And if we're selling it off just for money uh, and for short-term gain, that is not a good custodianship of our long-term interest in this endowment that we've all been given by nature. 
And we've got to start thinking in systems. We've got to start thinking about the globe as, as an ecosystem that we, we need to preserve. We can't go on killing the environment that sustains us. I've heard, you know, if, 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 the, if uh, the entire world was to consume resources at the rate that Americans are right now, we would need four Earths to keep doing this over the long term. We are using up this planet. We need management of it. And by taking control and saying, taxes aren't just a little thing the government takes to give you services. Oh, we give you that in exchange for a uh, police and courts. Uh, that, but this is what you owe to everyone else for taking things out of the environment. That establishes the environment as the people's endowment and the people's to make the rules over. They can make rules for better resource management. Now, um, now that can include things like getting rid of factory, getting rid of factory farms, or making rules that make it harder to have factory farms and more expensive and more difficult to go on with these extremely wasteful food producing practices we can that do provide cheap food if you ignore they if you ignore all the pollutants they put in the environment and how much they wreck our land and our water if you ignore that it's very cheap but if you actually look what they're actually doing to our biodiversity and to to the health of our economic system they're not cheap and so basic income can come along is part of the assertion of ownership of the environment, which goes hand in hand. It goes right along with, with that treating the environment as the people's endowment that needs to be preserved as an ecosystem that can't just be counted on to sustain itself without people being really careful that they're not destroying this thing as they go. Oh, well, that's great. But Katerina, it looks like we've got an environmental talk after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned Katarina. It, she's in Ontario where I live and I'm in Toronto. She's in mm -hmm. uh, Kitchener or Waterloo. They're kind of the twin cities that you look like you're in New York right yeah, now with Kitchener Toronto Waterloo. sort of in the background. Yeah. You look like I got a little pin here. Yeah. <laughs> um and uh we had a realized that we had a degree of separation from uh Jesse Gollum, who's uh uh, been a recipient of basic income, which is pretty exciting. Um, so she can talk a little bit about her experience, um, kind of foreshadowed there that it's a past experience, uh, unfortunately, for the ill-fated um, program in Ontario. And we realized we had two people from Canada and we invited Guy Standing from the UK who gave a presentation and we felt we needed to have uh, some sort of an American element. So Jesse gave a short list of, of uh, great thinkers in the US and she, um, you were on, I think the top of the list. Somehow I got on the list. Uh, very, <laughs> very kind of you, very kind of you, Jesse. Well, That's you're the kind one who responded. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you uh, obviously, as I just mentioned, expanded the, the topic to uh, interesting areas about uh, ownership and I think that's that's wonderful so our plan was that you would give your presentation it was it was uh, amazing and, and so uh, obviously well thought through this is a world that you live in which makes me think that it, it just must be so frustrating to then understand the world that we that we are given well it's it's, it's also hard to present because I'm trying to distill uh, I'm trying to distill several books and articles into uh, into a 20 minute talk or a, a half hour talk. So, so I have one book, one book on my theory of freedom, which came out a few years ago, two books on the, on the prehistory and history of the property rights system that's showing what people believe about how property begins is really propaganda given to us by early property owners. Uh, and the effects that it has on freedom and, and, and equality and so forth are, 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 are very often wrong. And then this other, uh, and the second of those is still, it's only in the copy editing stage now. And then this fourth book that I'm trying to write about thinking of the earth as the people's endowment, which kind of brings all of these things together. Um, so, so it's a lot of work. So if it seems like complex, like I'm alluding to something that maybe there's a lot more to it, 
Well, yeah, yeah, there is. And, and I, I won't be able to get to the get to the bottom of it. But I can uh, like to think of a presentation is like a, it's like an advertisement for 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 your writing and stuff like that. So I'm going to refer you to the to my my writing with uh, with the presentation. Carl, I wanted to ask you, are you aware of the work of uh, Dr. Shelley Ostroff? Shelley, and how are you spelling the last name? O-S-T-R-O-F-F, -F, Ostroff. Mm, and he, no, I don't think I am. So she wrote a book called, um, on, I mean, she wrote a book called Democracy in Crisis or something like that. And then she is working on eco-governance. Yeah. And she and Jan Golding created the codes for a healthy earth, mm -hmm. which pretty much, um, I think, resonates with what you were saying about, yeah. you know, what our responsibility is to us planet and why you need to govern yeah so i would like to bring the two of you together oh that'd be great so uh you also should know since you know this is a basic income panel and jesse so jesse uh jesse uh katarina and i are we're kind of like going right into the we're, we're at least we're participants in the in the basic income panel, we're kind of just drifting right into that from my talk into this panel. Uh, and I don't know uh, if everybody, if we're all, uh, well, we'll all just chat here. Um, but basically, but since we're having a basic income panel, I should let everybody know that today is the last day of International Basic Income Week, which International Basic Income Week has been going on for about 15 years. But when it started, it was just Germany and Austria or maybe Germany, Austria, and, and the German-speaking parts of Switzerland. Uh, so that, that's international, you know, crosses one or two boundaries there. But now it's worldwide, um, and uh, people on all six inhabited continents are, are uh, participating. We're working. Maybe next year we'll get somebody in Antarctica, you know, and we'll have all seven continents. But uh, we've got people participating. And yesterday there was a, a march for basic income, a worldwide march for basic income that took place in about 45 cities around the world, including New Orleans, where I am. And even though the reign of a tropical depression was, was coming down on us, so, somebody decided, no, we're not going to postpone. This is basic income march day. We're, whoever wants will march in the rain. And we got like 40, 50, 60 people out there. Um, we had March and we, we didn't set up a sound system. So we had uh, bullhorns and stuff and set up a sound system and we, uh, and people had rain gear, but people had, a, people seem to have a pretty good time. Uh, Jesse, did you, uh, did your area March for basic income yesterday? Yeah, actually, um, we uh, we had the uh, basic income march in Toronto. Um, oh, so uh, all right now, cool. Yeah, um, I'm I'm cur I just live an hour outside of Toronto, but we didn't end up doing a physical march. Um, just um, some new socially distanced guidelines have been introduced by our provincial government, so um, we felt it was safest to do a virtual march. <laughs> so it was uh, probably the most. Um, laziest march we've ever done because there was no actual physical moving around but um we had a whole bunch of speakers and um it was really um really powerful um, presentations and really great great um events so i look forward to, i'll be posting the video soon once it's ready to go um but yeah it was a really really good event and um at the um at the highest point we had about 250 people on the zoom call uh watching and listening which was just awesome Oh, that's great. That yeah. is great. We, uh, we actually, yeah, we were one of the few places that, that uh, went ahead with a march, um, but physically, it was a physically distanced march. So we, uh, we made sure people lined up and they were like six feet apart. And we were in a big, um, we, we, we were in a big park that we knew we weren't going to fill up the park. So we knew we could, we could sit far apart. It was a bit when it started raining and people, started bunching up under the one tent. I was like, no, we can't do this. Those of us with rain gear all have to like, get out of the tent. You know, we yeah. got to stay distance. Yeah. So I, I wore my mask when I gave my talk and stuff like that. I have and a procedural all... question before you move on. Do you want yeah. me to stop the live feed and start again so you have two videos? No, oh, I think it's okay to have one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one's fine. Okay, that's fine. Please yeah. go ahead. Go right into it.
maybe, maybe it is fair that that uh, since we did have a presentation, Carl did that had so much content that maybe just a quick round of questions before we get into the full panel. Okay, sure. Is there any? Uh, were there any questions for Carl, or we just understood him perfectly, and uh, all our questions are answered? I, I had one. There was, uh, I mean, you, you described a, uh, a formation of, of the, uh, our current ideas of ownership. What was it replacing? Was there, is there anything in Indigenous culture that, that uh, was taken away and um, maybe something worth examining again to uh, infuse and, and uh, gather some of that Indigenous wisdom to... Um, be part of our, our direction forward. Yeah. Now that is a hugely complex question because of course the indigenous peoples or the, the people who are were there before the colonialists are an extremely diverse group of people. So you had all kinds of really different things happening. And and you know, and the indigenous peoples gotta include people like the, the laps in you know northern northern Scandinavia and you know from the laps down to uh, the, the Terra del Fuegans and the, uh, the Aboriginal Australians, so many different groups with different ideas and the establishment of the property private property rights system was not a plan, it was a trend that took about 5,000 years, took four or 5,000 years to create. It begins in Egypt and Mesopotamia um, with, with kings and royal families carving out property that becomes their private domain. And next, the temples get in on it. A lot of, uh, a lot of religious organizations are really the second property owners after the royal family. It begins not, property begins not from a farmer going out and clearing the land and becoming a homesteader as John Locke's myth would have it. And the story that people who want a private property rights system always tell, this does not happen among indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples will tend to, and then again, there's so many different diverse indigenous groups. Uh, it uh, doing it so many different ways. They'll tend to establish something that is much more sharing and then First, you get, you get conquerors coming and taking it and establish some, some, some sort of royal privilege. And then uh, property rights being created from top down, filtering down among the, among the upper classes. So just really the opposite of what we're told to believe where property rights comes from. Now, uh, private property rights. But what, what you find is that nomadic hunter-gatherers, hunter-gatherers who... Uh, who don't have a fixed don't have a fixed place to live, but move around from place to place, will tend to view the land as something that cannot be owned. But also to that that now you might be associated. Well, we're the group that tends to live here, and they're the group that tends to live over there. And we want we move around here. Nomads are not aimless wanderers, as we tend to think of them. They usually wa wander around in a defined range. Um, but we'll look at the earth as something that can't be owned, but something that the fruits belong to everyone. And you find some consistencies with hunting and gathering groups is not only do they view, so the land is everyone, no one can stop you from going and hunting and farming. You don't need to get to ask somebody for a job. Hey, can you, can you, uh, can you employ me? Can you give me a job going and hunting and gathering? You just go and hunt and gather as you wish. However, if you bring food back to camp, if you want to camp with other people, you have and you have more than you can eat right yourself right now. In most in in most hunter gatherer communities, the rule is you must share, and that includes not only for food but tools. If you have two spears and somebody else doesn't have one, um, and and uh, and you say no, these are my spears. You can't have one you will not be camping with that group for very long. You will get sick of their incessant calling you what a jerk you are. Why are you camping with us? Uh, and even with, when you get farming communities, 
throughout in India and in Europe, right up until the, the simultaneously the enclosure movement and the colonial movement. You have peasant agriculture we have, where you have a community that by that is kind of like a collective farm and kind of not. They, that people will farm their own plots, but they might not farm the same plot every year. And they will make some decisions as a group. What kind of crops can you plant here? How many years in a row can you plant crops before you have to have uh, cattle on this land to replenish it? Uh, so they make a lot of group decisions and that, and that nobody particularly owns land, but as somebody who was born into this community, you get guarantee that you will get some plot of land. So instead of had a, having basic income, most of the peasant communities of the world had basic land access. And if we had basic land access today, we might not need basic income, but basic land access isn't practical in the system we have. Uh, so I think in exchange for the direct access to land that's been taken away, um, that what we owe people back instead is a basic income. Thank you. That's a very good insight. And, and it really led back to that, that idea of uh, unconceded Turtle Island, that uh, land wasn't ever really owned. It was just uh, transferred from, and this contract of changing it from one person to another is uh, largely a manufactured illusion. Oh, yeah. Oh, and well, and large parts of, of Canada have, uh, I think, never been, been ceded by treaty from the native peoples. Um, whereas the United States, I think that's that's less true, but only because they held people at gunpoint longer and then to uh, put an X here and then, okay, that's a treaty. Danny has a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Good morning. Danny. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I, I, you know, it's more like the earth owns us. We don't own anything in natural law. But <clears throat> here in the States, we have eminent domain. Mm -hmm. So the government could literally come over and, and repossess anything that you think you own. And um, I guess I wanted to hear a little bit about um, ideas for governance in the, in the new world and what that might look like, where ownership is not an issue because everyone accepts that you know, or gives up the concept of ownership. Could you speak to that a yeah. little bit? Yeah. Does anybody else want to start or should I start? Because we're on, we are a panel now. Go All for right, it. Well, I'll start. Um, that, I think looking at it that way is, is, is really, I think it, it is, it's a big step forward to say the, property owners don't own the earth, the community owns it. But really what you're saying is a step far is that the, the community doesn't really own it either. Like without the environment, we, are, we don't exist. And if we, um, so to the extent that the community is, gonna, is going to assert ownership, it needs, and that's why I use the word custodian, that we need to think of ourselves less as the owners of the environment as the custodian. And the uh, environment didn't used to need a custodian until we came along. It, it needs a custodian, it needs a human custodian because only human custodians can protect it from the damage humans are doing. We're like uh, an invasive species in our own habitat. So we need to think of ourselves. So now we can do this, it, it, it's, it's in one sense of enlightenment to think about our descendants. We want them to live, uh, so we need to leave them a thriving environment. So if we even think only about humans, we should, we should be thinking ourselves as custodians of the environment, but we should also be thinking of things that the environment itself has its own value and the other animals have, have their own intrinsic value and we're just a part of this. Uh, the more of the the, we think in this way, the more cautious we're going to be and the higher price we're going to put on your right to strip mine and your right to put pollutants 
uh, and greenhouse gases into this, this earth. Um, so yeah, that kind of thinking I think is really central. And I, I think people are moving in that direction. People are getting governments to move in that direction to think of themselves less as the representatives of property owners as they do now, and more as the representatives of, of first the, the people in general and future generations and the environment as a whole. Um, getting, a lot of people are starting to move in that thinking, getting governments to follow them is, is of course the most important step. Yeah, Eric has, sorry, Eric has a question. Oh, I want us to speak to that too. Um, okay, go ahead. That uh, I'm with, uh, one of the groups I'm involved with is called Citizens Climate Lobby. And what we lobby for, you know, for a livable earth for everyone and strengthening democracy by empowering people to uh, build political will is we're lobbying for a higher price on carbon pollution um, mm -hmm. or a price on carbon pollution. And then that money gets distributed back to the citizens um, in equal share. So that very much ties into, um, you know, the polluter pays and it's the people with more money and more property that pollute more. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're paying more in than they get out. Um, but people on the lower income scale tend to pollute less. So they'll be net benefactors, which kind of ties into the basic income um, concept as well. So I think that um, makes me believe even more in the work that uh, Citizens Climate Lobby does. Mm -hmm. Eric, you, had you, a Jesse, question? you haven't gotten in much yet. Um, I don't on this issue? comment at this moment. Okay. You both said everything that I wanted to say, so, <laughs> so far. We were just wondering about uh, the transition. What you, you addressed this a little bit, but what does the transition look like? And what's the time period? What, what do you envision the time period as being? Um, well, that's okay. That's getting out of my my area of expertise is, and it's said because I specialized. In, I wanted to specialize in poverty because, as 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 a white kid growing up in a half black, half white uh, uh, town in the United States, right after the civil rights movement, I was like, oh, well, we solved that racism problem. So really the next big problem, worst thing in the world is the way we uh, treat the poor. So I'll work on that. I'll fix the next big problem, you know? And then I realized, okay, well, we actually have, uh, we can't do anything with, with um, the donor class controls the US government and most other governments in the world as well. It, um, and we don't have a real democracy as long as money is controlling politics. That's just as big as problem we're working on. And then I come to learn we're killing the environment that sustains us. That's bigger. And then we have like American ra racism wasn't over. Okay, I'm sure none of my my black schoolmates were as naive as I was about. Oh, we solved that one. Uh, but a lot of the white kids in my town were. Oh, um, oh, this isn't over. Oh, we all have all these other huge problems. And like, but. Okay, I've been specializing in this problem for a long time. I'm specializing in this one. So that answer, I don't know as well. However, the, the key to it is that the people have to take back control of our, well, if we ever had it, maybe we never really have had it. Um, the people have to take control of our governments. The governments that have done the best, both, uh, both environmentally and, um, and uh, egalitarianly are the ones that have the best democracies, the ones where the people have the most control of the government decision-making. I'm thinking mostly of Finland, Iceland, and Norway, to a lesser extent, freedom, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, and maybe uh, a few other countries where you've got, where you've got a, a government that is much more responsive to its actual humans instead of corporations than the United States is, and you get you get a more equal society and you get a better working economy. So the people have to take back control. How to do that, that's an activist question. The sooner the better. I mean, this has to be done. This has to, this, 
it has to be done right away. Um, and, uh, and the people need to trade control. And on that issue, I hand it over to people like Jesse, because uh, I say, I'm not an activist leader. Jesse's an activist leader. I'm an activist follower. When the activists want me to come out and give a talk or participate in a march, I'll do it. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Carl. And and I was gonna I was gonna say like when I started like I I'd never been like um, much of an activist before um, before basic income happened. Um, and um, like I'd, I'd always you know I'd vote in elections and be informed and you know speak my opinions about certain issues. I care about climate change. I I care about um, about racism and and all the all the all these issues and the intersectionality of issues. Um, but I realized um, that when um, basic income happened and, and I was on the pilot, if uh, people didn't hear my presentation from the other day, I was on uh, the Ontario basic income pilot. So it was uh, this um, pilot project that was uh, put forward in Ontario and experimenting whether a basic income would work. And I was one of the recipients in that experiment. Um, unfortunately, the pilot was canceled prematurely. There was a newly elected government um, a liberal government that was replaced by a conservative government that canceled the pilot. And that sort of threw me into the world of activism. And, um, and um, I realized um, how privileged I was um, in that moment, um, that it was a privilege for me to not um, be advocating and not be on the front lines and not be fighting. Because when I got to the front lines, I realized I'm standing there with people who have been there their entire lives. Um, people who face discrimination um, or racism or sexism or um, have disabilities um, and or um, are, are fearful for the future and climate change and everything. And, and, and some of these people have been doing this their entire lives because it is a matter of life and death. And, and the moment it affected me was the moment I found myself at the doors. Um, and, um, and I realized that, no, this has to be a lifelong thing. And this has to be my civic moral duty as a human being to be advocating and to be fighting these injustices, especially if I have the privilege to not need to fight or have to. Um, and then another thing I noticed, I was very um, um, pleasantly, like, like the, the institutions of government, um, at least that I have found in Canada, were a lot more accessible than I thought they were. Um, and I don't know if I can say that for every single person or I can say that for other countries, but I did find that I was able to, like if I wanted to talk to my members of parliament, I could and they will respond. Um, and um, like, it wasn't that hard for me to get in the doors and I'm still pondering about that and the balance between that and the privilege of not being an activist until now because now I just realized it's like, no, I have to. It's my civic duty as a human. I don't know if that answers that question or um, what the transition would look like. Goodness, I don't know, but I do think we need a revolution. And I've been thinking that for years and years and years. And, you know, I've asked myself the question, like, why didn't Occupy work? Or why, what, why, um, like, you know, we're seeing the world just being shook to its core with like issues like Black Lives Matter and stuff. And like, how, what's it going to take? Like, you can only push a population into the corner so much and oppress them so much. And eventually they're going to bite back. And when's the point we're going to bite back? Like my entire generation is shouldered with debt and chronically underemployed and, and overeducated, um, and like, you know, like the, the uh, super, super ultra rich class that operates at the suffering of all humanity, like we spell these issues. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with that, but like, yeah, I don't know what it's going to take. When, when is humanity going to bite back? When's the, when's the dominoes going to fall? And, and, you know, is the pandemic enough is, is, is seeing the world get get destroyed because of climate change enough? Is uh, mass poverty enough? Like, I don't know. I don't know what else it's going to take to get us there. Maybe I'm just kind of like crazy and want to see the world topple so we can build it up again and make it better. I don't know, but that's a little bit the anarchist of me. <laughs> Perfect segue into Sharon's question. Sharon, you want to ask? Um, um. 
uh, I'll try. I have actually written in the chat, so if you don't mind, I'll just read it out. Um, I, I perceive it as a, I perceive the transition as a language change because without a uh, mentality shift, we cannot lead to paradigm shift. So we have to change our language first. And although um, selling a vision sounds very game A because in game B, we ought to um, do what we want by our internal uh, passion by our internal desire instead of uh, being sold to an idea. But since we're still in game A, so let's hack into the game A mentality and think in game A. So how would people uh, be sold to an idea? Is what is the good? Because we all know the bad, why the system that's printing money is failing. And so we are living in a world of scarcity, right? And so now that we don't talk about externalities anymore, we don't talk, well, I'm not saying that we don't emphasize, uh, we don't make awareness, but I do think that people know, deep down we all know, but there is this helplessness that we think, we don't believe that it's possible to solve. So we have to make it possible, at least linguistically, we have to make it possible to, to sell the ideas to the world that, oh, it's actually a better vision, a better world out there. It's so long as you try, it's easy if you try. And so I think like, especially for someone from Hong Kong, we are a very small island and we like living in scarcity. It's my, it's everybody's issue. And all our lives, we are so, uh, afraid of not having um, uh, a private um, houses of our own and you know youngsters there is no way for us to um, to to get what um, um, like, there, like there's no chance for us it's almost like because the you know the game is the game is set it's designed for people for there is only one percent of the world to win our Print money printing system does not cater for everyone. It's the setup that we have set ourselves up. So how about we change the idea and say, look, how about um, we, we uh, try to choose a, a, a certain place that we want to own together? What good would it come out of it? And if we own it together, what can we make out of it? And then we self-assess it voluntarily to pay that tax, for example, if we're still in game A, we still talk about tax, right? So what kind of tax that we are willing to keep it to reflect that value in order to keep it? So that we need more collaboration, we will encourage more abundance to come in to keep a shared purposes to achieve better, to share, to achieve shared goals, but, uh, greater purposes. But that, that's how I perceive uh, the transition as in we need language change, like talk more about push factor. Um, there was one, there's this place in Liverpool. They have built so many, developed so many properties that no one is buying. I mean, there are no one local is buying, but lots of overseas investors from Hong Kong, from, you know, East, from Asia, we're buying it and then we're not getting the, the guaranteed yield. And then, but you know, Liverpool is such a cultural place and there must be people who will really want to live there to share, uh, you know, the passion of, you know, a football city, a music city. And so what if people who all like music live together and go there and, you know, build a beautiful city, like, with a vi share vision and then we're willing to share we, we decide uh, for f, f make decision for ourselves and create a commons that is shared by similar pe with pe people with similar languages and you know that's one of the examples like how language can change um the, the during this transition transition it's a very interesting idea of, of uh, how we uh, get, gathering people together with common interests. We're going to have Jeremy Lent talk tomorrow, who uh, is going to talk about how, you know, that the our governing systems generally don't follow the contours of, of the world. And he uses California's example, which has so many diversity of land types. Why would you have one governor that's got to juggle all these different uh, concepts? So gathering people of similar 
community values is, is and and art and expression is is kind of an interesting dimension to that. But you also uh, tapped into that that fear, and I think that Carl set up a very good um, example of how this is, uh, what we've got is is a culmination of many kinds of fear. It started with feudal fear of invasion, protect, protection from a king. And we've now gotten into uh, a situation where our fear is uh, a commodity for our, our governing class that are using it to benefit corporations. And uh, they and, to do all the jobs that, that uh, they feel need to get done, whether we want to do them or not. And the... I, I can't overemphasize that, that it's really important people understand that this fear is not a natural fear. It's created by a threat. If you, if you talk to indigenous peoples, and I've read a lot of anthropologists who have, indigenous peoples who have direct access to land, which is very few people left who do, if you talk to them, uh, you do not find them afraid of being without food and shelter and clothing. None of them have that fear. They do not fear homelessness because, because, and they do not fear poverty because poverty is not living low. Poverty is a lack of access to the resources you need to survive. The only reason that you might have to fear that is when somebody else controls those resources and won't let you have them. So this fear is something that is a threat that effectively privileges the, the wealthiest among us, those few of us who have enough property they can live off that for the rest of our lives and puts everyone else under this threat that we need to keep working. And they will try to sell the middle class on it and say, oh, the basic income, that's for those poor people who don't want to work. Uh, and you're the good people because you want to work. And then you're like, yeah, I'm going to keep working. I'm going to be a good person. I'll be a good person. Keep working. But it's self defeating for all of us because it puts us in this position where we are running on fear and have this constant fear over our heads that if I don't keep working, I won't have a place to live and food to eat. It is self-defeating for all of us except for the top one or two percent. And we need to really have a different system, which whatever kind of system we have, whatever mix of capitalist and socialist institutions we come out with, if it doesn't have a universal component with a basic income for everybody, it's gonna put the middle class and the lowest class and the most vulnerable people under this threat that they gotta work for those in power um, or they're going to be out on the street. Another thing um, I wanted to add to that, um, thank you, Carl, was that, um, that there are some like, kinds of work that don't get paid. So, um, you know, very good work, like taking care of your child. I, I remember uh, when I was on my first maternity leave, I was kind of thinking, this work is very meaningful, but low pay um, versus maybe my work um, for an insurance company that was not very meaningful, but high pay, you know, and I was noticing that, uh, that conundrum. And I like how um, basic income can be framed as, I mean, we're not paying you kind of thing to stay home with your child as such, but we're giving you access to those resources so that you can make that choice. You know, so it's a way to support you um, in those choices of maybe you want to, you know, work for your community or be an entrepreneur or really start those conversations with government and be an activist and raise awareness in your community about how we have a, a paradigm shift in order to make the earth sustainable. Um, and, you know, basic income supports that. So I think that uh, putting it as a, it's greater freedom is a really nice way to put it. Yeah, and it is greater freedom. Like it, it is even a privilege to be able to be a stay at home parent because you still need to have a partner who is bringing in some form of income enough to be able to to do that. Um, yeah, which which not a lot of families have that. Um, yeah, and and I also was thinking, um, kind of just like about this whole billionaire class, and I feel like everybody except for this one percent is under this, um, like 
for lack of a better word, and I know it's a very popular feminist term, like a glass ceiling in terms of what opportunities we can get, because like there's not a single way that um, that the richest billionaires in the world are working so hard that their labor is worth that the hourly wage that they are making for the billions of revenue they are making. Mm -hmm. And, and then there's also some questions to whether the billionaires are really happy because maybe yeah. they just kind of want to get richer and richer, you know, like they're, they might be overcome by greed, which is not yeah. healthy for them either. Well, the stuff you bring up makes me, you know, you know I realize that it, it is that people say that we have a work ethic in, in Western culture, and that's simply not true. We do not have a work ethic. We have a money-making ethic. Some of the most important work like taking care of children, taking care of sick relatives, um, is not is doesn't count. That doesn't count as work. Uh, and then things that clearly are not work, like being a wealthy person and getting a call from your broker saying how your portfolio is doing. Uh, that uh, because that makes money. You're just making lots of money. That counts. We count those people when nobody says these lazy people are, aren't working. Well, their money is working for them. We have a money-making ethic. And it's very twisted because a lot of our jobs are counterproductive. They're killing, they're killing the environment that sustains us, or they're just providing crap that nobody really needs. And then uh, a lot of the re I mean, a lot of the reason that, that you have billionaires is, is because the, the real money in capitalism is not from doing stuff. The real money is from owning stuff. Uh, we have a saying now, thanks to Thomas Piketty, the entrepreneur eventually becomes a rentier. What you, your reward for being an entrepreneur is you get to own a bunch of property and then you keep that forever and the property works for you. You don't have to do another thing in your life. And if your great, great grandfather uh, was an entrepreneur, you own stuff. You don't have to do anything. The work ethic doesn't apply to you. Your stuff works for you. That's the ethic we have in this country. And it's a really horrible ethic. And isn't it so twisted and messed up then that they say that poor people are poor because they're lazy. Yeah. It's yeah. the richest people who aren't doing anything. Like the yeah. hardest, the hardest million dollars to make is your first million dollars. But then once you have a million dollars, you can invest it, you can you can buy robots to work for you. You can do whatever you want and sit on your ass and play video games all day and still make money. Like what a twisted irony and a cruel myth that so many people in our world believe. Well, and, and uh, George Orwell uh, pointed this out in Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, or is it London and Paris? I always forget the right order. Uh, in the 1930s that, um, we, we don't, dis, we, we, we say we disparage the poor, uh, the, the, I can't remember the exact wording, but something to fact of, uh, they say they disparage the poor because they don't make a living or they don't work for their living. Uh, and what he says, the real reason for the disparagement is because they don't make, they don't make a good living. Actually, the poor people that he lived with when he wrote that book work really hard keeping themselves alive, even if they were going from homeless shelter to homeless shelter. Uh, they worked really hard keeping themselves alive, but their work didn't count because it didn't generate a lot of money. Yeah, and their work not really even being seen as valuable or people judging the type of work as valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I know yeah. for myself, I kind of experienced that like when I became very public with all my work with basic income, then of course, my life becomes public and people are like, oh, she's a photographer and she's a, a piano player. Those aren't real jobs. Go get a real job. But then also disparage some of the re people also disparage some of the real jobs and like, you know, look down upon like garbage collectors or custodians. But you know, it, it's just it's just such a weird way that people are so cruel to the to the low to, to the lowest earners in our society. Yesterday, I read an article about like just there's a lot of shame in our around in our system about money. So money is worshipped as a god, and if you don't have that money, so like I like quite how you said it, Carl. It's like a money making ethic. 
you know, and if you don't make enough money, there's a lot of shame around that when really there's often like a lack of opportunity. There's unequal opportunity. There's unequal access to resources and, and so on. I have two questions. Um, one is, you know, can you frame basic income as, uh, as something that you have to give in order to make people feel that they belong in the community? Because if there is no income, then you're saying you don't belong in the community. Okay, that's one question. The second is, can you argue on the basis of our declarations of independence where we say everyone has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that a basic income is actually mandated by that? Absolutely, especially the second one. Um, I, I sort of think of basic income as a collective investment in humanity and in that it's, it, it, it gives people those opportunities to, to, yeah, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the privilege and opportunity to be able to pursue your dreams instead of being like enslaved by work or enslaved by having to earn money and, and having to have that money to survive. Um, and, and yeah, how did we get there? And, and when did we go away from living communally? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to defer to Katarina or Carl for a second while I think. <laughs> well, the, uh, on the first part, I mean, that goes back to what I was saying about indigenous peoples, whether it's a farming community or a hunting gathering community, being a member of the community almost invariably around the world that guaranteed you access to the resources that you need to survive, whether it was a, a plot of land, a farm, or was access to hunting and, and gathering grounds. It was, it was guaranteed just by right of being born into that society, everybody had that. We have taken that right of direct access from the mass of humanity, and we've given it back with nothing really we've given nothing for it and just put you in a position well you can try to sell your labor to uh somebody who owns property and they don't have to buy you they don't even have to buy your labor if they don't want it but you have to sell it that's how far we are from a communal right to the resources of of the of the community um that's that's something that all humans had, it was taken away by the colonial and closure movements and basic income, I believe is the best way to restore it now. I have a question for the panelists. Um, at one point today, we talked about like basic income gives people money, which is kind of the basic, you know, currency of how we do things. Um, can you also see a movement that gives people, and I think that's the right way to go, but do you th think we also need a movement that gives people access to actual land where they could grow some of their own food and, and so on, perhaps in a community setting? I mean, I have a large garden, but that's because I have a house with, with some land on it kind of thing. So that's part of my privilege. Well, I would say for, for in some cases, I think that, is, I think that is useful. Um, the, um, there's, there are, there are native communities who've done that with some of their revenue have given people a grant to go and, and, and forage on their, on their lands in, uh, I was the Cree who were doing someone in somewhere in Northern, in Northern Canada. A uh, native group was doing this, giving people greater opportunity. In Britain, they've had a tradition of an allotment where you go, where you have, you, you can have a right to a garden with free of rent. But I don't think this is a realistic solution to freeing the mass of humanity from the labor force. When you think about 20 million people in the New York metro area, area 30 million in New Delhi, 30 million in Tokyo, 30 million in Beijing. The idea that all of these people are gonna get direct access to, to the land, uh, it just doesn't seem realistic to me. We've got to get them cash instead. 
No, I agree. Yeah. I, so I'm saying let, let's do cash. And then should mm -hmm. we also think about like as a next step or a further evolution? Well, yeah, I, I agree with this, but well, there's two things. One thing is cash. The one nice thing about cash is you can buy anything with it. Um, if you want to get your basic income together with 10 of your friends and start some sort of cooperative, you can. And if you want to start a business, you can. If you want to start up a, a, a if you want to become a musician, start a band, you can do that with it. You can also use it to buy land or rent land or, you know, it gives you access to resources. So in one way, it directly does these things. But also, I think we do need to think about, do people need direct access to resources and how do we get them to? I think just about every city in my country needs better parks, bigger parks, and better public transit to get people there and to get people the interaction they need with other people around their community. Uh, and those things are, I mean, public transportation is another form of direct access to resources. It makes it, it, makes it, it, makes it easier for you to, to access all the land of your community, whether it's, whether it's somebody, else, a friend's house that you have a hard time getting through, getting to if you don't own a car, or whether it is to get to a park or to get to other people. Um, so all of these things I think are important and they all work together. I, basic income is what I most write about, but I, it doesn't mean these other things are any less important. Thank yeah, you. A lot of uh, activists and people I know, um, and not less um, advocate for access to land, but more for affordable housing. And I know at least in my city of Hamilton and in Toronto, that is a very, very, um, real real issue as housing is increasingly becoming more and more and more and more expensive um you can get a shack in toronto for a million dollars so i'm just i i see a lot of that and that's sort of fighting for affordable access to housing and housing that's good and 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 actually livable and i think that's one part of the whole puzzle of this world revolution like basic income is one piece of the puzzle but access to housing or access or ability to have land um sustainability climate change i think it's all just all interconnected there's also a formula there to to solve gentrification in uh, large cities which exists in toronto and it was so pronounced when i uh, went to manhattan and even our as a tourist, our tour guide was giving us a, a lesson on, on gentrification as we did the lap around the island, which I think that's that stuck with me to this day. Yeah, and if, if anybody doesn't know where Jesse's home is, uh, it's on the map right behind Ray. Uh, you'll see that you see Toronto just below Toronto. You see Hamilton there. And and even like speaking of gentrification, like. Hamilton has a really interesting history of that. Like um, the street um, that I live very, very close to, um, James North, um, in its past, like in Hamilton has a similar story to Detroit in that it was a very, very prosperous city um, that um, has an industry and that industry is steel. And then in the 70s and 80s, a lot of those factories closed down. Um, creating a huge depression in the city. And for many, many, many years, Hamilton was seen as a very rough place, a very dirty city. You don't want to go there. In fact, when I moved to Hamilton almost 10 years ago, all the people at my in my hometown said, why are you moving there? It's a dirty, crime-infested, um, crazy city full of homeless people. Why are you moving there? Um, I moved there because um, this one street with, that I live on um, used to be a really dangerous, not nice street and not good. But then, you know, it's super cheap to live there. So then artists start opening art galleries and then they start hosting art crawls and those became extremely popular. And then they um, start holding street festivals there. And then, you know, the cost of that street has gone up. And I've watched over the last decade as these galleries have been slowly shutting down and getting replaced by bigger, fancier, expensive boutiques, more, um, you know, really expensive restaurants. Um, you know, I, there's a, um, a one music venue got closed down and replaced by an architecture firm. Another music venue got closed down and is probably going to be replaced by another, uh, a law firm. Um, so we're watching, I'm watching gentrification physically change my city and the reason that it got gentrified 
was the artists that lived there and made the place beautiful in the first place. Yeah, and it's not those artists who, who moved in and made it beautiful who are benefiting from the progress. It is the landowners, the people who just happen to own the land, the people who own stuff, not the people who do stuff. Now, a landowner might work with their land and improve it, but they don't have to to take part in this. You just simply own land, collect checks on rent, and if the people who, who live on it and work on it and live there Im improve the city and make it better, the landowner gets the money for that uh, entirely unowned. And that's where uh, things like that is where most of the rewards in the world today are going. Uh, 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 Thomas Piketty had this great stat, which, you know, when people say, oh, we, you know, the capitalism rewards entrepreneurs like uh, like uh, Steve Jobs of Apple Computers who made $8 billion, but look at all he did. Well, in the same period of time, the heir to the L'Oreal fortune also made $8 billion and didn't do anything but collect checks. That's the way capitalism works. It's about owning stuff, not about doing stuff. E.T., you have a question? I think you're still muted. Oh, yes. There Thank you very much. Well, I've really appreciated what you've said, but I I wanted to know what you thought about Silas's first question, but now I don't think I can rephrase it. <laughs> Silas, you want to ask the question again? I, I forgot what it was too. <laughs> oh, yeah. So no, my first question was, you know, can you frame basic income as something you need to give in order to tell people that they do belong in our community? Well, yeah, my answer to that was indigenous communities for hundreds of thousands of years, direct access to the land was guaranteed by being born into a community membership or being fictive kin by moving in and joining the community. It was guaranteed by that. That was taken away that access to the land became, you can go to the to property owners and beg them for a job, is what we get and said. So um, we, have, we, we have denied what is really one of the most basic things of community ownership and, and basic income is restoring that. I think it's the most realistic way to restore that. If you're part of this community, you are a part owner of this community. I think basic income is really the most realistic way, or at least one essential component of realistically bringing that back. So and follow that, up and question say, Lash, I would add to that, that um, yeah, if you think about how basic income will be paid for, and it's mm -hmm. uh, in Canada, we would need tax reform, for example. Um, we would, we could either like get rid of our non-refundable and uh, our refundable tax credits. Um, maybe we could put a wealth tax on and we have to, yeah, restore that idea is that the tax you're paying is part of your, you know, that's what you owe to be part of our community, right? Tax is not a four letter word. Um, you've been privileged. You, you have to contribute back um, and build up the community. So um, yeah, so I think it does tie in. I think and follow up to that, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're talking directly about it. Uh, yeah, I was going to follow up to that asking, is it even possible uh, without monetary reform, without changing the you know, fractional reserve money system? Well, I don't know if it, it might be possible to do it without it, but it sure is a lot cheaper to do it if you change that. Because what we have now, the most democratic institution in America is the Federal Reserve Board. It's government of the bankers, government by the bankers, and government for the bankers. If you own a bank, you help make the decisions in, in for the Federal Reserve, and it's there to protect you. It's there to protect your interests, to further your interests from all other interests and your profits, and it, it insulates you from risks by putting those risks off onto your customers and your government takes those risks for you. And it's really great to be a banker to have this Federal Reserve Board there for you. This 
if we take that Federal Reserve Board and think and convert it into something that is of the people, by the people, and for the people, we will make billions of dollars, even if we don't make any other changes. Billions of dollars that then wouldn't have to come out of our, our taxes and are just creating, and it would billions of dollars that is, or maybe trillions, that is going to people that are just taking it and they're buying stuff with it and they're pushing up the the cost of rent in places like Hamilton, Ontario, because they have nothing else to do with their money other than buy up a bunch of this property in these up and coming places. So uh, so I don't know if currency reform is essential, but it's certainly helpful. Um, maybe we've uh, been agreeing too much. I want to try to introduce something a little bit more provocative. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Rao has, has got a program where he wants to feed the world, make food. I've called it universal basic nutrition. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, universal basic income is always about money. And, and I know that Carl has an idea of why it always has to be money. Well, I'm the one who's been talking the most. So I'll defer to you two if you want to go first. Well, at least with money, you kind of have the, like money gives you a level of freedom and freedom and being able to choose. So you can like, like I, I also believe in and think that food accessibility is extremely important, especially access to healthy food. Um, and, and you kind of see it that like um, the rich people are like, like, like the best food and the healthiest food is always the most expensive. Like the organic aisle is the most expensive aisle. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever been to a food bank. Um, I once had to go to a food bank um, years ago because I could not afford food. And um, when I went, um, I found that all the food that I got was processed. It was canned spaghetti shit, craft dinner, um, like just really like processed fake crap. And, and I just thought like, I don't know if I can eat this or if I want to eat this because like this is so unhealthy. Um, and, and so like access to healthy food, I think is so important, um, in a society, but I do believe that like money, like universal basic income is what gives you that freedom to choose and freedom to choose, like, what will you eat or what, what will you do? And, and it gives you a bit more freedom, I think. And then you've identified an injustice of food that we, we identify that organic food is, is being the best thing for our nation, but it's not subsidized. We have no. wheat that's subsidized, yeah. we have of grain that's subsidized because it's uh, something that can be traded on the world market and be fed to animals as well. So um, I think it, Katerina? Yes, I like basic income as money. You know, I think that's where we start because we have a sort of a, you know, you go to the supermarket, they want money <laughs> if you want to go buy food. And, you know, not everyone has access to a garden and so on. Um, but I also see that um, what we really need also is a transformation in our agricultural sector um, and encouraging farmers to transition to organic methods because um, the conventional methods do use fossil fuels, right? For fertilizers come from fossil fuels. Um, they do pollute the land, they erode topsoil and so on. What we really need is regenerative agriculture, which is organic and that stores carbon, no till and so on. So I could see another program where, you know, people get basic income, but they also get maybe a little debit card uh, that gets filled up and you can only use that money to buy um, organic food. And then that would really open up a lot of entrepreneurs to say, okay, I've got, way more demand now for organic food and I have people with money to pay for it. So like there's demand and the money with it. So often in our capitalist society, um, people look to sell things to rich people because why, you know, you can't really sell stuff to poor people. They don't have money to buy it, which is another big injustice. Um, you know, and I see that tying into like reform of our pharmaceutical companies because they will work on lifestyle drugs rather than uh, like their goal isn't to cure diseases that affect the most people because often those people are very poor and they don't have the money to pay for the 
the, the drugs. It's it's better to to sell these lifestyle drugs. Maybe keep people chronic. You know, they don't mind if people have chronic illnesses because then they need constant meds uh, to keep them alive and to keep those symptoms at bay. Yeah, so a lot I, of these issues are, are interconnected and these ideas. Like I really like how Carl uh, framed it. You know, this is kind of new to me. His his framing of uh, the private property rights. I mean, I guess I've, I've heard a little bit of these ideas in the past, but that helps helps me really think about them in, in a new way. So I want to thank Carl for that. Yeah, well, this question for me, this question hits on the other way that we tend to be paternalistic towards the poor. One is the poor have to prove themselves worthy uh, in order to, to get anything. And, they, and, 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 and it's so, that version is so self, self uh, it, it's, it's such a uh, self-serving form of paternalism because how do we ask the poor to prove they're worthy? Well, will they work for the rich? Then they're worthy, that makes them worthy. Um, so self-serving, but yet self-defeating for most of the middle class. Now, but the other way, so after once you get by that, you say, you, we're paternalistic towards the poor to say, oh, and they don't know how to decide for themselves. Oh, they're gonna buy all the wrong stuff. They're gonna do their, so I have to decide what the poor need for them. And, and people who don't know what it's like to be poor, people who haven't lived through poverty that don't know why they're making the decisions the way they are. And most people do, most people do the rational thing in their position, they're doing what a reasonable person would do in that position, what you would do if you understood their position. Um, and those who don't are, uh, those who don't do what a reasonable person does, you'll find them among the rich and the middle class as much as you will among the poor. But yet it's only the poor we wanna supervise. We always wanna think we're better than the poor. And it's, it's part of this belief that we don't wanna feel guilty that actually uh, there, but for the grace of God go I, go I, that I am not really better. I wanna think that, that the reason I'm here and they're there is because I know something that they don't rather than that we have a really unjust system. And just the fact that somebody's lower you doesn't mean you can judge them either for, for their merits or for their ability to make decisions in their own interest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and I wasn't thinking like, oh, we need a debit card so people only buy organic food. I didn't, was that what you were referring no, to? No, no, oh, no, I know. I wasn't referring to what you said, like the idea of subsidizing organic food through something like that could be really cool. What I was talking about is the people that, that are saying, well, it is that are saying, you know, uh, we've got to make sure these, these, these people aren't buying drugs and this and that, and we got to get them, we got to get them this, or, uh, uh, oh, I'm not going to give a homeless person, I'm not going to give a homeless person cash, I'll give them uh, a canned food. When, uh, you know, they probably don't even open a can opener. They don't own a can opener and might not, uh, you know, don't have any place to cook canned food, you know. Uh, that kind of paternalism that I'm talking about. The, yes, because yeah, this card would be to everyone rich or poor. And I guess if you don't want organic food, you wouldn't buy it. You know what I mean? So there's a bit of that. But and I definitely Very think of like an income floor, you know, like you need basic income. And then this is another idea just to transition our food system. It's a very dehumanizing sort of thing to think about too. Like, you know, how, um, how society sort of punishes the poor by like supervising them and judging them on their choices and, and what they're doing when really like, like people are just trying to survive. And, um, and people are just, and, and that like, I read a study that said that like, um, people in po like if you're in poverty, like, your IQ points actually drop, like your intelligence is lower just because your brain is so stressed with trying to survive. And that's all your mental energy is going towards. And, and still to like punish people for that sort of constant discomfort and stress that you're living under. And then it's also interesting because like the issue of food accessibility, I believe is a relatively new Thing. Like, like my grandmother, who is 92 years old and spent her childhood in the Great Depression, accessibility to food was never her problem. But she also grew up 
on a farm in a rural Ontario in farming communities where like people shared food. Um, they never went hungry because they had a whole garden full of vegetables. And even to this day, if I go visit grandmother who still lives on the farm, despite being like, she's a very healthy 92 year old and will give me bushels and bushels of vegetables every time I go see her. So like, that's interesting too. And where did it shift and how did the accessibility for, to food become so unsustainable? See, that's what I think we should do. We should offer the homeless people and the poor people that kind of food. We should offer them farm food and organic food and not judge them for what they're eating because what they're eating is what we're giving them. So it's we can judge easier. them. If you if it becomes a community thing, because the soup kitchen issue is is also becomes a, a one of uh, dignity. Uh, in, as we approach these existential crises, I think that community resilience is going to be on everybody's mind, and one of those aspects could be resilience for food. Let's get the food thing solved, and it doesn't need to be a soup kitchen. It could be something more like a. Uh, a, uh, a Mennonite uh, food hall where the community gets together and eats the same thing. This whole idea of that we need restaurants to structure everybody's, uh, you know, I'm feeling peckish for such and such is, is really very much tied to our, our immense consumption habits that uh, uh, we've developed in the West and have spread around the world. And uh, that's part of our way. We, we recognize with the COVID crisis, how restaurants uh, stopping really put a lot of the most consumptive industries in a state of panic because they need that waste. They need that, that consumption more than everybody was still eating meals. Why is there, why are they panicking? Because they need that, that uh, uh, accelerated consumption. So um, we've, as we approach this, this uh, concept that Dr. Rao is, is trying to feed communities and he's already feeding communities and, uh, the uh, in Phoenix, in Arizona, um, trying to get this idea of community is so important because uh, I think that it's uh, we we talked you were talking about those those vegetables and like gross vegetables we don't want the worst of vegetables we want the best of vegetables that should be the basis of a of a nutrition sharing program. And there is such a thing as um, staples. Like if you had, everybody had their staples, then we just kind of build upon that. So it doesn't matter really your, your uh, um, level of society. And I, I really wanted to bring up the idea of our concept of, of uh, race structure. And Salesh uh, um, is from India. So the caste system there is probably something that's very, he's very aware of. How do we um, eliminate this kind of attitude towards our, our uh, class system in society. And Sharon mentioned uh, changing our language, which is very much about the identity politics of, of uh, this, this great movement that we have right now. How do we unite class issues with that? And that's clearly a convergence of, of finding a solution, of changing everybody's mind about how, how everything works and build something that suits us. It kind of reminds me of um, the Sikh tradition, um, Langar, of uh, providing free meals to people, regardless of caste, religion, anything. Um, yeah, um, which I, I think is a phenomenally beautiful tradition. Annie, you had a question? You have your, you have your hand raised? Um, I know we're like thinking about how to transition, but you know, there's a couple of things that kind of quirk me about this is, you know, the whole monetary system is, is a control function. So that has to be aborted. It just has to be aborted. We have to think of like what, um, what we need to provide in communities, regardless of, you know, assumed cost, because all of that is manipulated. A basic income doesn't mean squat if somebody chooses in their quote unquote free market system to start charging you know more for space because they still own it and they have that function so everything is relative under that old system you know i think we need to and i 
vulnerable system to start with where just like in a community, everybody's basic needs are provided and start there and think about production and currency and exchange, you know, let it, let it build from there. Um, I just wanted to throw that out and see if anybody had a response. Thanks. I think basic income is, is worth doing. I mean, yes, it's still using money, but <laughs> money's kind of <laughs> our, our basic, the way things are, things are going on in our society right now. So I think that's a good way to transition. I mean, we can, we can uh, I would say let's implement basic income if we're still finding that um, it's keeping people in poverty, then we can look at, okay, is it because the basic income is not enough or because we really have to scrap the idea of money altogether? I wouldn't quite kind of go right to let's get rid of money altogether because that is just so out there that I don't think that can happen. I think basic income would be a, a better, more attainable goal. And it's something that we can see right away. Danny is in our uh, online think tank that, uh, that I manage for, for Dr. Rao. And one of the rules that we come up with questions and we have to categorize them into, is this a new model question of, of our, our ideal utopia? <laughs> or is this a shift solution that, that works right now within our given uh, parameters of, of capitalism and all the elements of, uh, that, that we really do want to fix, that we recognize our leftovers from the industrial era where industry was, was the focus of everything and, and propping up industrialists was the model. What are we gonna do to fix our society? So the, I, I think that uh, basic income, because it's something that we can do right now is that shift solution. And once you get that, it changes a lot of these other uh, these other plans. All the plans that really seem utopian suddenly become a little bit more real. That seem more in within reach, and for not the least reason that when you are freed up to do what you want to do, you get what we have here: a bunch of people that want to change the world. We're not none of us are, are paid to be here. We want to volunteer our time to uh, you know change the world, and yet. So many people aren't here because they had to go to their job. And a lot of those people are, you know, watching the clock and waiting for the time to end to serve their master, get their paycheck and thinking, if I didn't have to do this, what could I do? What gifts do I have to give the world? So that idea of gift economy, I think everybody resonates with, but think of it as a utopian concept. It doesn't need to be. It could be right around the corner if we can start implementing these these new systems and getting people really on board and with this it doesn't take much imagination to see what uh, how it can improve our lives yeah we have uh, five minutes oh sorry go ahead. jesse go ahead um and i actually i have to leave right at 11 but i just wanted to um add or just the thought that that the, the subject of community keeps coming up and and the idea of like like community helping to make everything better. And I, I agree with that. I think it's massively important, especially like, you know, Carl has mentioned in reference like indigenous communities and villages and that sort of mentality where everybody is taken care of in the village and 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 that and that nobody gets left behind. Um, and I actually on that note and thinking specifically about basic income, I have a story. Um, of, a, of a woman I encountered um, earlier this year. Um, who, she's in the United States and um, she's part of the Yang gang. She loves Andrew Yang. Um, and she um, has lived in poverty and has been through the shelter system and is currently living as a nomad. Like she lives in a truck and drives across the country. I love following her adventures, but she met somebody in um, who's part of, who, who's like part of Andrew Yang's campaign gave her a basic income for a few months and she used a lot of that money to help other people so like a specific story she told me was that she met another woman at the shelter that she had been staying at and this woman was um needed a new cart because her cart the wheels on her cart had broken and all all of her worldly possessions were in this cart so this person used her basic income to buy her friend a cart and, and that cart was like the huge difference between having possessions that you can keep with you or losing everything. And I think that you kind of see these moments of like small organic community building and the opportunity to be generous 
And a lot of people on the Ontario Basic Income Pilot use basic income to volunteer and, and to help other people. And it's really cool to see, like, nobody was like, there, there, you didn't see that sense of greed. It was more of a sense of generosity. Um, that at least that's what I've been seeing in, in stories and testimonials and, and just in my experience and my quest to find all the basic income recipients and get to know them. Yeah, and I wanted to mention, thank you, Jesse, that um, basic income is also a good way to help address our, like someone asked about race and um, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, like what, what do we, how can we reconcile with Indigenous people in Canada, um, you know, because of the genocide taking away their land and so on, residential schools. And because um, poor people like are disproportionately, you know, black and indigenous, basic income is a really concrete way to address like racism and, and reconciliation. So I, I really think that that gives a lot of freedom to the people that have been um, oppressed the most in our society. So We're it's really, really a thinking for justice. Carl, you have the last word, I think because we have only two minutes left. You, you're muted. Am I? No. no yes. um, I, I, I don't know how far we have to go to change the system. We have to change the system to make sure that everybody has, their, has enough to meet their basic needs, whether or not they participate. Um, if just and that's just the start uh now if doing that is in a is, 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 that might also require to make that sustainable might also require regulations and taxation of landowners and other property owners so all whatever whatever the individuals get doesn't just get eaten up by then you can you might be able to do that with a land value tax which will reduce speculation and uh, reduce the amount of idle properties that are out there. And you might be able to do it with certain kind of regulations. If those things don't work, then we got to look for more wholesale reforms. I haven't looked that far, uh, but I know we try these things first. If this doesn't work, then we have to move farther. As a solution for, uh, for all the things that we need to fix in the world, can you imagine if we had universal basic income right now, how many people would have showed up for Extinction Rebellion? To, for their disruptions. Unfortunately, I have to go because I have a meeting right at 11, but thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank Make you. Sure to check out